questions. If I could ask, what is something that really annoys you or gets under your skin? Another way of asking this question is, do you have any pet peeves? Small one for me is when I'm driving by and I, I see gas signs, whenever they put the three upside down, I just say, who is doing that? Are they doing that on purpose? The, the big loop does not go on the top. It goes on the bottom. Get your signs right. That's just an annoyance. Um, but as I was researching this past week on, on annoyances, I came upon some famous characters in TV, the, the top 10 characters of, of being annoying. And, and one of them was uh, from a 90s series called Family Matters. And I'm not sure how many people remember this guy. His name is Urkel. Does anyone remember Urkel? All right, very good. And Urkel's whole persona is annoying. I mean, he's just kind of clumsy and a dimwit. And, and he's known for messing things up, for being uh, just a klutz. And then he had a tagline when he messed it up. When he messed something up, does anyone remember what he said? Did I do that? And it was kind of nasally, and it was just annoying, right? And it worked for Mr. Winslow, who was just heated with anger about Urkel and just, come on. Well, I believe, and the reason I have your mind going with annoying things is the topic for today, I believe, is probably one of the most annoying things we encounter in this world. And consider grumbling for a moment with me. If you have a friend or if you have someone in your house or workplace that is a grumbler, after a while, you just kind of get fed up with it, right? Like for a little while, you can empathize, but after a while, you hope that they move on or would just stop bringing you down because here's, I think, what is true. No one likes a grumbler or a constant complainer. A couple reasons why. First of all, it can dim your spirits. If you're having a great day and you're trying to be thankful and you're trying to be happy and someone is grumbling and detailing why they're grumbling, it brings you down, doesn't it? Another thing that grumbling is just bad and hard to deal with is it's infectious. It's infectious. I grew up in a household where if one had it, everyone had it. It's infectious. It goes to the workplace. If there's one grumbler, there's a possibility that there are many grumblers in the workplace because of that infection. Well, today we're going to see how not only we view it, but God views it. And so let's get into our lesson. As I was considering Moses and, and just one of the main themes throughout all of Exodus through Numbers, it is how good the children of Israel were at complaining. In fact, if you read, basically any of their responses have to do with a grumble or an argument or a complaint of things not going well for them. They've perfected the art. And then I see in response to this, God's amazing patience. We're going to see that today. They were grumbling about something. He's patient. He gives them what they want. All right, he answers the need. But what you need to know is, as I was researching this, he also got fed up. He had limits for his patience. Like one time they were complaining, and he sent out a consuming fire, and the fire burned up some people. Not kidding. Another time they complained, we'll talk more about this, um, they complained he sent out venomous snakes, and they bit them. You're going to complain? Here's something to complain about. And one of the most interesting passages I came upon when, when I was considering Moses this week is from 1 Corinthians. Paul actually gives us an indication of how God perceived those complainers. Look what it says in Corinthians. It says, They all passed through the sea, talking about his deliverance. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. God did not delight in their complaints. God did not delight in this attitude. And that's something, too, I researched. Never did I find that there was a spiritual gift of complaining. It was never esteemed. Imagine that, right? And so today, we want to take a look at maybe what was at the root of their complaining, but what we also want to do is find a solution and to replace and find a different attitude and be filled with peace and joy again as we try to be the people that please God, not so this is said of us. So let's get into it. Our lesson for today is from Exodus chapter 16. We're going to read the whole account here. And if you want to follow along um, with, with an exercise, I want you to try to keep track of how many times it mentions grumbling. Okay? So let's get into it. Read the whole section there. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. 
but you have brought us to this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather in on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it is the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat. I like this part because it's basically okay to eat at night, which I like to do. And in the morning you will be filled with bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. The evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin pl- flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? And that actually became the name of the food, manna, which actually means, What is it? For they did not know what it was, and Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The word of God. Did anyone keep track of all the grumbling? Seven. Nice. That's what I got too. And, and on top of the actual words of complaining, seven times it says grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. And the whole word is even annoying, isn't it? Grumbling. Mm. And we're going to look not only again at the root of their grumbling, but also how God provided for them, how God was gracious. And we're going to learn from them today. So let's, let's dig into the Word of God. One of the big news stories this past week um, was out of Detroit. And does anyone know the news that came out of Detroit? Exactly. They declared uh, the largest city that declared bankruptcy for their municipality. And uh, again, kind of just headlining our news. And there are many theories of why this happened. Some wonder, was it pensions or the decline of the auto industry? I'm not going to go there. Some wonder about, uh, you know, solutions. Will they get a bailout? What compromises will have to be made? I'm not going to touch that either. But one of the things I found interesting, just reading from the news, is what has happened to the city of Detroit over the past few years. For example, over the last 60 years, their population has decreased by half. In 1950, their population was at 1.8 million, the fifth largest city in our nation. And then again, over the last few years, over the last 50 years, they've come down to 700,000. Um, that'll affect some tax revenue, won't it? Um, that'll affect what the city can do and just kind of declining since then. And what I wonder is the persona and what's happening in Detroit. I wonder if there's anyone who grew up in the 50s or the 60s when it was just booming and they had their heyday, the fifth largest city, if there's anyone looking back saying, remember the good old days? Remember when people were coming here? Remember what our city used to be about and what we could have done? I wonder if there are any who are reminiscing, and if I had to guess, I bet there are some who are looking back and saying, there were brighter days before. The reason I draw your attention to this is because I think that's what the camp of Israelites are doing right now. We see this in our first verse. Look at what happens in verse 3. Verse 3, if you look back there, it says, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. So what are they doing? They're saying Egypt, the good old days. And if you're familiar, if you've been around, we think that this whole thought is delusional. When they were in Egypt, they hated it. They were crying out because they were slaves and they were oppressed by slave masters. But they look back and and it's not making any sense to me, but they're able to say, oh, the good old days in Egypt when we were slaves and dying. That was better. Craziness. Craziness. As we look at our own lives, this is one of the things that we can draw away from the Israelites. If you have a problem with complaining, Part of the problem where the devil might be getting you is looking at the past with rose-colored glasses. 
looking at the past with rose-colored glasses. In fact, I was reading from Charles Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll, and he had just a phenomenal quote that I wanted to share with you. He said this, We look back nostalgically on what was once a pleasant situation, at which time, even then, we were looking back longingly on a more pleasant earlier time. And isn't that true? If we had a full picture of the, the good old days, we would remember that they weren't all good. If I just use Detroit as an example, even though they had a heyday at one point back in the 60s and 50s, they had huge community problems with racism. In 1967, there was a huge riot. It was not all good, right? So this is for my first point, if you struggle with grumbling like I do. Remember that the good old days weren't all good, weren't all good. And, and I say this because, again, the devil might be getting you. And, and again, it's not bad to look back completely. We can't help that. But here's the thing. If your perspective on the past isn't helping your perspective with the present, I'm not sure it's helpful. I'm not sure it's helpful to go there. All right. So the grumblers. Well, God responds to their grumbling, and he actually gives them awesome provision. He gives them, again, the quail at night so they can have full tummies when they go to bed. That's awesome. And then he provides the manna. I was reading from a psalm that, that kind of described what this food was. And listen to the description from Psalm 78 of what they ate and they drank and how God provided. It said this, Human beings ate the bread of angels. <laughs> now, if there was a shop selling the bread of angels, would you go there? Would you want to have that? I would. He sent them all the food they could eat. So again, not only was it quality, the bread of angels, but there was quantity as well. They had all they had to eat. They did not starve, right? Now, I don't know about you, but again, if, if, if I had my pick between having the Lord Almighty as my chef, or even like Gordon Ramsay, I would still pick God making my meal, right? That would be good. I wonder what that was like. That'd be awesome. But do you think it was enough for the camp of Israelites? Do you think they just erupted in praise and thanks? They didn't. Uh uh. In fact, if you know their story, they grumbled at this at the bread of angels. In fact, later in Numbers, they would say this about the bread of angels We detest this miserable food. And here's a rule you need to know don't ever complain against the chef, right? And especially when God is your chef. Don't ever complain against the chef, especially what God is. Sorry, bad joke. All right, but here's the thing that happened. After this statement, this is when God actually sent those venomous snakes throughout the camp. Bite them. Don't complain against the chef. All right, so I continue. We learn another thing about grumbling from this, though. And this is this, that if you're really good at grumbling, you not only complain before you have something, but when you get it, if you're a good grumbler, you complain that it wasn't exactly what you wanted. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I think if you're a parent, you have had this experience, right? Maybe there's a parent in the building who, at one time or another, just really wanted to make the child happy. And so they're going to the, the store and their toy aisle, and I don't know what kids play with, but I'm going to try. Oh, that looks nice. Or you're making a meal or you're getting takeout, and you're trying your best so that they might say, Oh, I love it. I'm so happy. But have you ever had the experience when you do this, and you come home, and that's not the reaction? But I wanted what my friend has. I wanted something else. Come on. This does affect the Bloomer household. This past week, I uh, was making pork chops on the George Foreman. Does anyone still use a George Foreman? Yeah, it's old school. It's great, though. It's a great tool, guys. Come on. Anyway, and I was meticulously planning. I don't want them too dry, you know, overdone, and I want them cooked thoroughly, you know. I've got to be careful with pork. And I get done, and I set the, the steaming food in front of everyone, and it's a masterpiece in my mind. And I'm thinking that it's just going to erupt in praise. Oh, yes, jolly good fellow, and it wasn't the case. There was one, and I won't say who. It was a child, though, um, who said, this, this isn't what I wanted for dinner. This isn't my favorite food. And it's frustrating, isn't it? It's frustrating. Well, I think this is how God feels. Think of God. He's been good at blessing us, hasn't he? I could look at your lives, you could look at mine, and I bet we're so good at looking at other people's lives and saying, man, they got it good. We have good things. But what does he so often see? He sees children saying, 
but I wanted something else. But I wanted more. Come on. And it's frustrating. God looks down and can't my kids just be happy? I've done so much. But no. Which leads me to my next point. When we complain, I think we need to know what our complaints and who our complaints are actually going to. Look at verse 8. We find who these complaints are actually against. Verse 8 says, Moses also said, You will know that the Lord, when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us but against the Lord. Do you know about the complaining? Moses picks it out, and, and it's a spiritual truth that for you and I, we have a lot of different reasons to complain, and, and I can empathize. I bet if, you were in your, if I was in your shoes, I'd probably say, yeah, I would complain, and you'd be in mine. I could see how you complain. But even though our causes for complaint are different, the spirit within us is the same. Who do our complaints finally go against if we're complaining about our life, whether it's our job or our relationships or what we have? Who are these finally coming to the feet and the throne of? God, right? God who watches over. And so this is what we learn about complaints, that at their core, complaints ask, God, are you there, for one? And God, do do you really care? As we complain and complain. So what should God do for complainers? Do I have any complainers in the building? I'm among you. And the rational, reasonable response to this is be like the chef who goes off the handle. The rational, reasonable response, he should do what he did back then. He should send snakes. And so we got a bunch of them down here, and they're going to go out, grab your kids. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But that's what he should do. He shouldn't give us any more good. He should punish the complainers. But he doesn't do that now, and he didn't do it back then. So even when he sent the venomous snakes, what you need to know is he provided a way out. One of the stories we can't focus on is is how Moses crafted this bronze snake. And he put it on a pole. And he put it so that everyone could see it. And so that anyone who was bitten by a snake in that camp, whenever they looked at that snake, they were spared, they were saved. And that sting didn't get them. For us, what does God do for us complainers? He doesn't punish us. He says, anyone who looks at this, my son who I've raised up on a pole, and says, there's Jesus, my Savior, they too will escape the sting of what we deserve. That we will not be treated as our complaints deserve, but we will be treated by love. And here again is evidence of a heavenly father who cares so much about you that he will do whatever he can to give you everything you need. You are forgiven, and I am forgiven. But true heart of forgiveness is saying, I don't want to be that anymore. If he had to endure that for me, I don't want to go down that road anymore. True repentance is saying, make me not what I was, but make me what you want me to be, dear Lord. And so let's talk about that. And if we've struggled with complaining, let's talk about what we can do to please the Lord. And if we could replace our complaints, what would we replace our complaints with? Does anyone know? What should we replace complaints with? Thanks. And praise. Let's talk about that, dear friends. Replacing complaints with praise. This past week, I was uh, in one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 103. And I was told to, to journal every now and then. Journal what you're reading from Scripture and how it applies to your life. And I came to this passage from Psalm 103. And it said, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, I was, as I was applying that to my life and trying not to forget all his benefits, I, tr- I started to list all the ways God has been gracious to me. And yes, I could have listed salvation first. But then I went in to think of, uh, man, God blessed me with a beautiful wife. Man, God blessed me with some kids. Man, God blessed me in in a move when I was young, moved closer to Disney World. Man, God blessed me in, in this or that arena. 
And if you came in here complaining today, I want you to do this exercise right now. We're going to take just a couple minutes. I want you to look at your life and bring to your attention when God answered a prayer of yours, when God met a desire of yours, when God fulfilled a dream of yours. Can you do that now? Again, the exercise is to bring to your attention an answer, dream, prayer, or desire in your own life. Go for it. Did you think of anything? Could you find something? I know I can. If I'm searching for it, I sure can find it. And I can find more than one. What if we left today holding that in our thoughts? Instead of focusing on the news ads and what we don't have. What if we just claimed what he's already done for us? That's a healthy looking back, my friends. To look back with thanks. And one of the questions I have for you today is, how do we become a people of praise and thanks? What more can we do? That's another question I want you to try to answer. Some examples for how we become more of people of praise and thanks, just a couple things that I've heard. Uh, some people have a blessing journal, where at the end of the day as they're journaling, they just recount the ways that God has been good to them. I think that's neat. At our, our family table, we're not perfect, but what we try to do is bring, bring what your favorite part of the day was today. What was the favorite part of your day? And turn that into thanks, to focus on the positive. Another thing we might do is if we're praying and asking for stuff, when he actually gives it, why not return like the leper in prayer and say, thank you, God. You did hear me. You did answer me. This is a tangent for today, but do you know when we live lives of thanks, we actually feel better physiologically? This is a tangent for today, but when we say thanks instead of complaints, it actually raises our level of serotonin, that neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. Turning thanks and turning from complaints. But I'm real with you guys. I know how hard it is. I've been around the dinner table and, and sometimes it's a struggle to come up with a, a favorite part of the day. And so if you struggle at all with this, I have a video. I have a video that maybe will help us get on the track of saying thanks. Let's watch this video. Lord, I'm struggling. Show me what I have to be thankful for.
Laura, I'm struggling. Show me what I have to be thankful for. It was easy for us to see, wasn't it? It's often easier to look in other people's lives again than our own, but what if we just pause and instead of taking for granted the, the great things given, we enumerate them. And we say, I'm not entitled to this, but God has given it anyway. Whether it be simple things like breath each day, ability to walk, skills to read, the talents he's given. And these were the basics. I bet, I'm willing to bet, when you draw that thing to your mind, the thing you just brought to mind, it was even better than, than what he had. God's been good to us. And it's good for us to respond with praise. Do you know Moses was good at this? The chapter before this, after they were brought out of the Red Sea and, and just experienced their deliverance, Moses and Miriam sang a song of praise. They, they said this. Um, this is part of their, their song of praise. Who is like God, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders, enumerating what God has done for them? We too can do this, can't we? Look at our lives and just draw out those blessings. Search for them. And just as there were consequences for complaining, and it broke that relationship, and God was angry, do you think there are consequences when we live lives of thanks? I think there is. You consider the leper who returned to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, and we didn't have it recorded, Go, your faith has made you well. He encouraged him in his walk. He got to spend that much more time with Jesus. When we live lives of thanks and praise, dear friends, I believe we spend more time in Jesus' presence and we walk a bit closer with him. That he is pleased in that relationship as we respond in thanksgiving for all he has done. So may we live in thanks and praise. Why don't we ask God to help us do this as we pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, too often I have been spiritually like a spoiled brat or I've just asked for more or haven't been content with what's given. Forgive me again of my sin. I look to Jesus. He is my Savior. And now replace my, pray, my complaints with praise. I need your spirit strength for this. I need you working inside of me to give eyes to see all you've given today and throughout this week and throughout my life. And then to live in thanks, whether it's in prayer, whether it's by telling others your greatness, whether it's journaling or any other thing. Let my life and my whole being please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.